So after the decree of royal supremacy in 1534, there was a period of an implementation of reform processes. So it'd be helpful before we dive into some of that to review what uh, Henry's strategy was in doing this. It seems that he wants to balance out various factions in his circle as he implements his own policy around religion. He plays these factions off of each other throughout the rest of his reign. So he wants to balance out uh, Catholic traditionalists in one corner who want to see no change at all. There are many bishops in this corner. He wants to, uh, he has Catholic humanist reformers over here who want the reform to go a certain direction, but then not much further beyond that. People like Thomas More would fit into that category. And then he also has evangelicals, people who really want to see a full-throated reform of the Church of England that looks like Luther's Germany. Um, in that corner is Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell emerges as Henry's crucial advisor during this moment in time. Uh, he has supplanted Thomas Woolsey as his as Henry's key advisor uh, through a series of political maneuverings. If you're familiar with the work of the author Hilary Mantel and her book Wolf Hall and the subsequent books in her trilogy, you're familiar with the ins and outs of Cromwell in this period. Henry has his own take on the Christian religion. And it's important to understand what his own priorities are in order to make sense of what happens during what looks like a chaotic reforming period during his reign. Up front is his uh, adherence to royal supremacy. So this is the first of four markers of his religious perspectives. Henry views his authority rooted in a divine mandate. That is, God has decreed him to be king of England, and he serves with that conviction in mind. At the same time, he is developing an increasingly anti-papal view that the Bishop of Rome is really intervening in Henry's own sacred duties. So this... Uh, motivates Henry to be active in, to insert himself into all aspects of the reforming agenda, and also to ensure that all aspects of reform fall under the rubric of royal supremacy, that the monarch is the head of the Church of England. A second piece is that Henry really doesn't endorse the notion of justification by faith alone, which is the cornerstone of a Lutheran evangelical theology. Rather, he views that there is an important cooperation of work and faith. Uh, we see this displayed really clearly in really the final religious document of his reign, a document called the King's Book of 1543, that he um, uh, has composed and oversees its contents. And in the King's Book clearly teaches that faith and work cooperating together are necessary for salvation. And it never indicates that faith precedes works. This is a real point of difference that he has with Thomas Cramer, also Thomas Cromwell. Uh, but Henry carries the day for his perspective during his reign. This is going to shift after Henry. So let's keep our eyes on that. Henry is also very much a sacramental traditionalist. He's very committed to a high view of the sacraments and the grace that they convey. He remains committed to the Eucharist and to the um, efficacious nature of the Eucharist. The Eucharistic liturgy is never reformed under Henry. It remains in Latin. It's practiced according to the Roman rites. And so it then implicitly conveys all of that about the sacramental penitential system that Lutheranism and the evangelical perspective is so opposed to. Finally, Henry really uh, endorses the primary authority of the Bible as a norm for all Christians. Here he's very influenced by Erasmus and Erasmus's perspective of the importance of scriptures for Christian life. So this position isn't necessarily evangelical. It could also fall into the Catholic humanist 
orbit. But I do have an image for you to look at here. It's from a, a, the Coverdale Bible, which is um, the, the artist, uh, uh, this is the wood carving that's placed at the beginning of this edition of the Bible. The Coverdale Bible is essentially an updating of Tyndale's uh, translation of the scriptures. Uh, we're going to spend some time together uh, deciphering what this imagery means, but take some time to look at this. I also have this up on uh, Populi, our course, Learning Management System. Henry really uh, views himself as someone like King Hezekiah, one of uh, the Old Testament kings of Israel who took it upon himself to engage in a campaign against idolatry. So he views himself as a good, reforming king, following a model of anointed biblical kings. One of the things to do when you review this list is four markers of royal supremacy, justification by works and faith, sacramental traditionalism, and the primary authority of the Bible is to ask, are these more evangelical or are these more traditional? And that's uh, hopefully a conversation we can unpack in class as well. There are two key documents um, that uh, really set forth uh, a barometer for what Henry's rel religious perspective was like. One is the Ten Articles, we're going to discuss that in a moment, and the other is the Six Articles, which we'll discuss in the next video. These two are often paired with, with each other as being intention or contradictory. So it's good to uh, be aware of that as we dive in now to discuss the 10 articles. The 10 articles are composed in August 1536 and passed by Parliament then as a statement of post-papal orthodoxy. We could see the influence of people like Cromwell in them, for instance, but also Henry VIII's own perspectives. One of the things you'll notice here is that as it discusses uh, the nature of sacraments, it decrees that there are three sacraments of baptism, Eucharist, and penance. Um, this is kind of ambiguously Catholic. Um, it maps, interestingly, onto Luther's own rejection of seven sacraments and his initial embrace also of the sacraments of baptism, Eucharist, and penance. Does this mark a more evangelical or a more Catholic position is something for us to sort out. When it comes to the article on justification, here it's declared that justification is achieved by the merits of Christ's passion and faith. So that can sound very much like justification by faith alone. But that article also declares that works are required as a sign of faith. This is different from Luther's statement in the Freedom of a Christian that works follow naturally after one is justified by faith alone. And Luther really wants to avoid the notion of requirement of faith. So again, is this more Catholic or is this more evangelical, this perspective? The final four articles are a defense of the use of images of church in church, rather, uh, a defense of the various ceremonies of the church that have not been reformed yet, and a defense of prayers and devotions to saints. Uh, what he also does here is criticize um, excessive devotion to saints or abuses of, um, of the cult of saints and of various aspects of the penitential system. These are critiques of devotional excess that um, are very much in line with ideas that Erasmus and other Catholic humanist reformers also articulated prior to the Reformation. So these kinds of critiques can just make Henry look like a good reforming king, but not necessarily a king who is opposed to the broad swath of the Catholic tradition. So this is a, an interpretive question for us then. Are the Ten Articles more Protestant or more Catholic? Or do we have another possible answer here? Let's try to discuss that in class. After the Ten Articles are passed, 
um, a series of in, of royal injunctions are also passed. Uh, the first set is called very creatively the first royal injunctions. These are issued um, by Thomas Cromwell under Henry's name, and they really represent an evangelical interpretation of the Ten Articles. So if the Ten Articles are sort of ambiguous in their meaning, Cromwell gives them a very evangelical interpretation and application. So he, he requires a couple of things in this. One is that the clergy ought to publicize the royal supremacy, the Ten Articles, and also um, there's a severe reduction in the number of saints' days that happen. And so clergy need to, just in all of their parishes and congregations need to declare all these things so people are on board with these changes. Second, uh, the injunctions state that priests ought not to praise images of saints or uh, pilgrimages and that the laity should be encouraged uh, to give to the poor rather than to give to images. That is, rather than to give to the upkeep of art and shrines and other devotional objects in um, the parish. Third, there's emphasis that priests now need to teach the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments in English. Uh, this is part of this necessary educational campaign that is really a part of any aspect of evangelical reform in this time period. Now, finally, it's declared that Bibles are to be provided in both Latin and English for the people to be read, and this is to be accomplished by 1541, so that every parish church would have a Bible. Now listen carefully. This never happens. Now, this never happens because of uh, Henry VIII's own change in policy. So don't get too carried away yet with the implications for that final decree. But we can see that many of the first three injunctions do happen. Okay? Another piece here is that Cromwell, um, with the support of Henry VIII, begins to suppress monasteries. That is, begins to close down monasteries. There's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that Henry opposes monasteries because of their wealth. He wants their own revenue for his own purposes, especially for national defense. Um, He's also very aware that as he's trying to assert himself as, as being the supreme head of the Church of England, that the, the monastic system sits outside of that. Monasteries uh, aren't under the authority of local bishops. They're under the authority of abbots. And abbots report directly to their own uh, orders, and those orders report directly to the papacy. So Henry needs to cut out and marginalize uh, the monastic systems as um, dangerous for his own uh, agenda. And there are lots of monks in England. Um, abbeys and monasteries are very popular, so he really moves against them. What happens is that many people who support traditional religion rebel when the monasteries are repressed. So in, from, October, from um, fall of 1536 to fall of 1547, or 37 rather, there is the Pilgrimage of Grace, which is a um, armed uprising um, using symbols of traditional religion to um, say no to what the king is up to. So 40,000 people engage in small levels of rebellion um, mostly in the north, some happens in, in the west, in the southwest. Uh, this is brutally put down. But it really shows that um, traditional religion was broadly popular in England. And it begs the question of what Henry is up to and how much broad support he actually has. After the monasteries are suppressed in sep September of 1538, a second royal injunction is uh, uh, passed by Thomas Cromwell in Henry's name. This one declares that all images of devotion or of pilgrimage are to be removed from parishes. So this is the beginning of a kind of purification uh, uh, of the temple, of not the temple, of churches. A stripping of the altar, as it were, according to Eamon Duffy's book. 
Uh, the lighting of candles before images is forbidden. Why? Um, candles were symbolic of prayers for the dead. And so the use of candles in front of images or candles on altars was highly potent as a symbol. And so the removal indicates a shift in theology. Uh, sermons are to be delivered, according to Cromwell, against the veneration of images and relics. And there's like model sermons that are to be provided for priests to use. And again, a decree that each parish ought to acquire an English Bible by Easter 1539 for people to uh, use and read in church. Again, that will never happen. But you see this agenda, this desire for scripture in English is a real part of the reform movements for Cromwell and his associates. Okay, we're going to stop here. This second royal injunction represents the high point of an evangelical reform movement under Henry. A backlash is coming. And we're going to see that in our next video.